slow your roll. So in any training that you're doing, slow when you have the opportunity, unless you're training specifically for something like speed or power, slow down the movement just a little bit. And by slowing it down, you'll usually find when you go through an exercise that if you speed up, it's usually because you don't have control through that particular range. And not having control through that particular range is what tends to lead to injury. This is the Total Human Optimization Podcast, the show that explores how to become the best version of yourself. We go in depth with experts in fitness, nutrition, and well being to examine new ideas and time tested strategies that can help you on the path to optimization. On today's show, we're talking with Shane Hines from the Onnit Academy to talk about the benefits of Steel Club training. Here we are again for another edition of the Total Human Optimization Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Shane Hines from the Onnit Academy. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So Shane Hines... You know, right now he's he's this dad that's rocking this really cool gray charcoal looking mohawk thing. But you know, if you knew him like I knew him before, he used to look exactly like Wolverine, and ex- and in fact was actually a stand-in for one of the movies. Isn't that right? <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Where did you dig that one up from? Hey, man, I know I know all. <laughs> oh, so I want I want you to because I know about the scene. So I want to know I want you to tell the listeners exactly what you were doing in that movie. All right. So well, it was for X Men Three, and uh, I had had these uh, rather substantial sideburns uh, before. I substantial had this... to say the least. <laughs> and uh, so, and I got a lot of comments on it. So I had some fun. Uh, took some pictures. Uh, had a uh, full sized autograph photo that I had sent off to Hugh Jackman, saying, "Hey, you did a pretty good job." <laughs> and uh, in the end, when X Men Three was filming in Vancouver, there was uh, someone had seen the photo and. They were like, could we get you to be the photo double for Hugh Jackman as Wolverine? So I immediately jumped on that opportunity and uh, had a whole bunch of uh, different uh, scenes that I was a part of. If you see a hand, that's me. If you see <laughs> like his back walking away, that's me. That's There was a bunch of different ones where you don't need to see his face. And that's where I jumped in. <laughs> right on. So... In order to get a role like that, you have to be in some decent shape. And your tool of choice is actually the Steel Club. So if you, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know what the Steel Club is, but I'm going to uh, err on the side of caution and say that maybe not everybody knows what the Steel Clubs are. As far as I go, the, when I think of like clubs as exercise tools, I think all the way back to WWF and the Iron Sheik when he would come to the ring with that big giant club. And you always you can see these videos online of these old ancient dudes taking these giant. I guess they're made of wood. They used to be made of wood yeah, back then, yeah. right? Clubs and just swinging them around. And they had that old that like old man strength. Like they didn't look like bodybuilders. They looked like frogs almost. You know, because they had a big chest. <laughs> you know, and like just. They're, but they were powerful and strong. Super strong. They just didn't look like the cut version we know of today. So tell us a little bit about about that history, about the Steel Club, you know, and, and where it came from? Well, the history, the club, when you think about it, has really been around for, uh, since the beginning of man. Uh, if you think about uh, caves, throw over. Cavemen, they actually over. did use clubs, uh, is that true? Yes, are, are you, sir. Are you, are you no, sure that's absolutely. a historical fact? That's, I, I'm pretty sure that's a historical fact uh, that's written down in the literature somewhere, it's Hitting you know heads it's, of a woolly it's scientific yeah they've got a, a painting of up on a wall somewhere okay. i'm sure there is uh but there's the idea of using a, a club or a stick or a weighted implement as uh, a hunting tool or a weapon and that's originally what it was and usually when people see steel clubs they're kind of like yeah that looks dangerous and well yeah it's it's history is based in 
being a weapon. And over time, they actually uh, more than just a hunting tool, because you'll see that across Aboriginal cultures throughout the world, they actually have these clubs or these sticks, these weighted sticks that they would use for hunting. And, and then as it became a weapon and a weapon of war, the weight, the idea of a club is that you have this uh, stick and it's slightly heavier on the end. And the slightly heavier on the end is because if you start to swing it, it starts to build momentum and the amount of force output from the torque uh, gets amplified. And so if I have a weapon, I can hurt you a lot more, not a weapon, but if I have a, um, a stick or a club of the same size, I can hurt you a lot more with the club because if I swing it and then bring it in, the weight will start to carry it through. So it became a weapon and it became a weapon uh, in war. And uh, they've seen, there are uh, examples of clubbed weapons, uh, maces, uh, closely related to mm -hmm. a steel mace, uh, but even shorter, shorter maces. And they're basically, or scepters, but they have had them across various cultures. The big yeah, ones so that, that stand so that, out. That actually went through medieval times. It too, did, it? absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And they would put the spikes on the end. Jesus and, Christ. Uh, I wouldn't want to be on the other end of, of, the, of the club. I mean, I'm talking about being the person holding the club because I'm a little squeamish when it comes to that. Can you imagine what it does to somebody's head when you take a, a spiked club and just smash it right through? It's either or... Yeah, or if one of the spikes just happens to like perfectly get into the eyeball right into of your the victim, oh it my would God. still it still crush it still crush their entire face a facial structure yeah. because it's coming in so fast and hard. So I mean the the idea of it being a weapon in war, uh, you'll see instances of it in Russian history, in Japanese history, in Indian history, both East Indian and Native American Indian, and Persian, Middle East. It's kind of been across the world. And what ended up happening was through that history, they eventually started, in order to prepare for the battle, they would start, they started using it as a training tool because there was also the understanding of, well, if I have to practice to swing this thing and the better I get at it, the more effective I'll be at smashing my enemies. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And what eventually ended up happening is as sport continued to evolve and the idea in throughout cultures, sport in many ways, competitions between villages, competitions between nations became a way of not necessarily having to go to war, but because they already knew the benefits of building the strength that they did. You talked about that, you know, this old time strong man yeah. strength that was tied to that. Then the these athletes started using these clubs and uh, in conjunction with that, maces in some cultures as a means for specifically preparing and getting stronger for that, uh, for the for the sport yeah so do you think there's still cultures that are still using the club not the steel club ha fancy steel clubs that we have today here in the states but do you think there's still cultures that are still using the old style big you know absolutely things you can make? actually if you look it up are on, those hand hand carved i'm guessing yeah a they lot just of take them... it from one big piece of, of lumber is that how it works yeah i'm not sure exactly the carving process that's it certainly looks like that uh and... i don't think they use any glues or anything uh, they yeah. might. They Maybe. might. Yeah. Uh, the, but there are. You can actually still see it on YouTube. People from uh, from other cultures using these tools. And two big ones that still really stand out in terms of their use are the meals, M-E-E-L-S. And those are the ones from Iran. And those are the ones that you would have seen uh, the, iron the iron sheik using yeah. and so they're a smaller handle with a much bigger they, the clubs look huge uh, the weights can get heavy but because wood can only it can only be so dense they have to get bigger and bigger and bigger to try and create a, a much heavier weight with those and so those are still being used today and yeah, YouTube, you can d definitely, you look that up, you'll see people using it. Uh, that's also very tied to a, um, a cultural, like a 
physical culture practice that they have uh, in Iran. And then the other is in India. In India, they've got the uh, Indian clubs, they refer to them, but they're not just the small Indian clubs that we tend to think of, like two pounders that you would use for your mobility and whatnot. They get very big as well. And they use those in combinations with uh, maces. Okay, so in this day and age, people aren't using clubs in the United States anyway to hunt for food or really to kill victims. No, <laughs> you know, nobody, in, nobody encroaching really on is. their territory. Yeah. So why would we use them today in fitness? What what's the point of that? You know, since we're not trying to use them as a weapon, what what are the what's one of the benefits of of the steel club training? So the benefit of steel club training is actually um and I think a big credit needs to be given for, especially in North America or Western culture, and the use of uh, a club the way we know it today in fitness was really pioneered by uh, a gentleman named Scott Sonnen. And he had been exposed to this idea of using clubs. And at the time, kettlebells were just starting to gain traction. But nobody in Western culture, at least, was really using clubs at all. And uh, he really got that started and in incorporating it as a means for originally to help train the martial artists that he coached and then really seeing the benefits from a fitness standpoint. So, and then that has continued to evolve. And now clubs, while not necessarily as widespread as kettlebells, are an acknowledged tool across the world. And there are many different versions of it. And as we have here at the Onnit Academy, our steel clubs are a version of uh, the, the idea of a club, the old clubs, and just continuing to refine the design and make it more effective for training. And so benefits of steel club training you would look at are one of the things is the offset load. So the displaced center of mass, which is closer to the end of the weight, starts to challenge our grip immensely. So that's a lot different than a, than a dumbbell or... Way different. Or even a kettlebell. In some, in some even way. a kettlebell. Even though kettlebell technically is a displaced weight as well, the handle is very short. And it's the, usually balanced. And... It, and the weight is much closer to your hand, so you don't have as much. Um, and especially because the handle goes horizontally from the bell the way a dumbbell handle is whereas with uh, a steel club what you're looking at is more of a vertical handle with the weight on the end so that changes the game and in many ways it really kind of lights up your nervous system there's a lot of information going on through your hands and i've had big guys we've uh, there have been i've had dudes who are very very strong deadlifting 600 pounds and you know strength athletes who have been interested in training in the clubs and we've trained together and within 15 minutes not even less than that with 15 pound clubs they uh, we're working through some exercises and they drop the clubs and their hands their hands come up and their hands are like gnarled like dinosaur claws and they're yeah, going so what so, did you do to my hands yeah so what is it is it a different set of muscles that you're working that you're just not used to is is that the basic premise of the of the thing? Yes and no. It's not just the muscles, but how you're having to activate those muscles. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. if so you I think know about, about the grip thing, because okay. that's the probably the biggest issue since I've tried the steel clubs is the grip. And you mentioned the 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 gnarled hands, the deformed hands you get after trying to to use the steel clubs after a long time. So tell us a little bit about that and the impact on grip. Okay. Uh, and for anybody listening out there, I, this isn't what happens every time you use steel clubs, getting these <laughs> gnarly hands like claws. It's just if a, an initial experience that can happen. Yeah, Shane's a hand model for Wolverine. So <laughs> you know, if he's going to continue to do it, then it, it's going to be fine for you. Um, yeah. So what it is, is if you think about a dumbbell or a barbell, when you grab a hold, it's uh, kind of just refer to it as a monkey grip. Like you just you grab a hold and it, there's nothing that your hand has to do other than holding on to the bar. When you have a displaced weight on the end, what ends up happening is when you hold it, it starts tipping right, left, back and forth. And as it's doing that, it will pull 
on your pinky, forcing into your thumb, or it'll pull into your index finger, pulling on your pinky. So what happens is your hand has to start becoming essentially alive. You have to be able to control and modulate between a strong grip for stability and being able to allow it to move so you can redirect the weight as you're going. Okay, so that kind of stuff, how, how can you apply that to your regular everyday life? Because you know, you don't really need a lot of grip to run a keyboard, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, or a mouse unless you have a really aggressive one. But, you know, how can you apply that into, into everyday life? Right off for the keyboard component, when we're working on keyboards, because our hands and our wrists tend to stay in relatively the same position and it's just the fingers moving, or if you're like me, it's three fingers moving. And what you end up doing is by actually working and strengthening that out, you release a lot of tension. Okay, so like the carpal tunnel type stuff. Yeah, the stuff that starts to lead to those kinds of issues can start to be mitigated by working with something that forces your grip to be alive and strengthen in that range. And then outside of that, if you think about it, if you bend down to pick up a bag, you you the bag, the handle is always slightly off if you're in a rush. You've got grocery bags. So you're carrying a bunch of grocery bags. That's not a nice even bar. It squeezes your fingers. Bags? To... You get delivery now, right? Oh, gosh. You Instacart. I, it's Amazon, right? <laughs> it's three hours. Yeah. You can get it in. <laughs> bags. Come on. All right, so those of us that still like to do it old school, carry grocery bags. If you've got your kids and you're having to pick up your kids, there is no, anybody who has kids, there is no picking up your kid with a simple... Grip. And that's not something you want to drop. No, not at all. And every once in a while, you do drop. And so, or they fall. Yeah. And you want a good, quick grip, strong grip to reabsorb so that they don't smash into the ground. But yeah, so you've got all kinds of examples where that really translates. And it's, it's funny when you think about grip as well, grip is still one of the primary indicators of health, just okay. health in general. And they use that as an indicator, especially in aging populations. So as we get older, they'll go through and look at, you know, different factors to kind of go, are you healthy? Grip strength is actually one of them. And they have done studies that have shown a correlation between how strong someone's grip is to how the rest of their uh, health, both externally and internally in their body, actually is. And the stronger the grip, the healthier they are. Wow, that's very interesting. So we got, this, we got the steel clubs now. And it's going to be kind of hard to explain some of the movements to the listeners. But yeah, it'll be a little if you tough. Can, if you can try to explain some of the movements you can do with the clubs and, and what that in turn benefits for you, that'd be awesome. All right. Uh, let's, think about, let's think about some pressing just to keep it simple. So if you were to, this is as if you were holding a can of soda because we're fitness professionals, so we drink lots of soda. And if you have a can of soda or a glass or a drink or something, you'd think about your elbow is by your hip and your hand is directly out. So your arm is now at a 90 degree angle. Put the club down and hold on to a club instead. And while you're holding on to that club, from there, you can just turn your hand out to the side. And as you start to do that, what you may find is your elbow will start to point back behind you because a lot of us don't have because of the way we sit all the time in front of computers, driving, texting. We have this real forward flexion, the state of forward flexion that we tend to be in. So actually opening your hand back while keeping your elbow bent at your side, that's really difficult to do. So if you have a club in your hand and you were to think about keeping that 90 degree angle and drawing that club out to the side so it's aligned with you horizontally, then, but don't let your elbow go past the side of your body. It's gotta stay close to your hip. As you do that, that starts to work your shoulder blades. And all of the, and all this time, the displaced weight on the end is constantly moving. So your grip is always, even for those who have been training with it for a while, when it looks dead still, it's still constantly moving. They've just become more sensitive to being able to readjust it. And that 
is feeding into your nervous system while you're working on keeping your shoulder blade really in contact with your body. And a lot of issues that lead into elbow issues, elbow tendonitis, wrist, carpal tunnel, that comes from not having a strong engaged shoulder blade with the rest of your body. So having a club, you can do this with any other tool, essentially, but the experience with a club is very different because of the way the weight is pushing down through the hand and the offset balance that you're constantly having to adjust. So it fires everything up. And so if you get into that side position and then think about doing a press out to the side, you just keep about, think about keeping that shoulder down and from that side 90 degree angle, starting to press your fist straight out working towards a locked arm. So you can do that out to the side, and then you can also do it from the front. So that same, just like you were holding your cup of water or your coffee, you have the club, think shoulder down, drive the elbow forward as you press your fist forward. Yeah, try to do that with your cup of coffee in the morning and try not to spill it. Yeah. It's almost kind of the same thing. It can be, except actually. Except there's no weight, except you have to, you know, you're trying to keep it stable because you don't want the coffee to spill out. That's kind of a fun little trick. And actually, an analogy, an analogy that I do use is in terms of keeping the club stable mm-hmm. and steady is you imagine like there's a cup on top of the club because the top of the club, for most clubs, they're flat. So if you were to put a cup on top of your club and you were to try and move it, so you're not haphazardly just like throwing it out there. (laughs) If you have a cup up there, you have to really pay attention and move it smooth. If you keep that in mind, it's very much the same thing. So even if you just had your cup of coffee, same idea. Yeah, that's kind of cool. So I would imagine, you know, looking at, you know, the first thing I think of when I think of clubs and not just because it's the name of the tool that golfers use is that if you're a golfer, this is has your name written all over it. And uh, a lot of people who do sports or athletic... Anything like a tennis racket? Anything, yeah. Tennis, baseball, golf. Hockey stick. Hockey. Anything that has to do with you've got this... Uh, Police baton. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that would work too. <laughs> if like it, it, And a big part of it is because immediately those athletes recognize the the forces that are being generated through their body. They recognize, oh, if I can control that thing, then what that will translate in terms of the what I use will increase exponentially. And that's another thing with the club is that the club actually allow it addresses or highlights to greater sensitivity a whole lot more of the rotation that's happening in our body. Little movement side note, we are essentially in constant rotation. So even when I'm walking straight back and forth, there there's rotation happening through the connective tissue and the muscles and my, the bones in my body. My structure is rotating. And so that's where a lot of injury ends up occurring is by our not being able to control those unwanted rotations as we move. So in any kind of sport or athletic endeavor where there is, yeah, I've got, and they're going into rotation because they're using that rotation to generate power. Using a club, it tends to highlight those and forces you to strengthen that because, again, displaced weight. And the nice thing about the club is its ability to transition between something where it's like stable strength. So we just talked about the front press and the side press with the club. That's very keeping the club stable. That's uh, more of more compressive work where it really requires our, our strength, the way we tend to think about it, force production. And then there's the opposite. It can immediately flip into where it's creating traction. And that's where the swings and the pendulums come into play. And that part is incredibly healing for the body. Because a lot of what we do, you know, we're under the force of gravity all day long, but a lot of the way we go through our day-to-day life, we're causing compression on our joints and uh, shortening of our tissues. If you have something that can create traction, what you start to do is you start to create space through your joints, and that allows for more nutrients to go in there. It allows for things like synovial fluid that helps lubricate the joints. It helps the connective tissue, 
which connects your entire body to ha to tap into its recoil capacity. It's like an elastic band. It shouldn't be brittle and taut. It should actually be able to stretch and come back into position. So if you use a steel club in that way, or that's what the steel club allows you to do, then you're not only getting those benefits, but you're doing it through progressive load. That's one of the unique elements or unique aspects of a club is its design. Can I do things that I do with the club with other tools like a dumbbell, like a kettlebell? Yeah, I can. But because of the shape of the tools, because they take up more space, I have to keep the weight a little bit further out from me. I have to uh, move myself a little more out of out of position in order to safely move that weight through the ranges that I'm looking. A club is narrow, it's sleek, so I can actually stay really strongly connected to not only my spine, which is the center of all our movement, but uh, over my base of support, which makes me stronger, and I can move in tighter and tighter ranges multi-directional, multi-planar, multi-angle, all over the place. And so the club, that's what the club really, that's a unique benefit of the club, is it lets me, under greater load, challenge all of those. Okay, so a misconception that people new to steel club training may have is that it's only for upper body. But there's some really cool movements you can do that really work your lower body as well. Um, I've tried the ones where you're holding a steel club in each hand, and you're kind of doing like a, a hinge kind of squat and you're just moving your arms extended out with the top of the steel clubs facing down and just slowly swinging them back and forth. That thing hurts me like a <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, those are called the leg drivers. And it's funny because when I do have folks who, and I have over the years, I do have folks who are, they look at, clubs as primarily upper body and they go yeah you know this is a good thing for upper body i wouldn't really use it for my lower body i'm like all right cool well let's uh let's try some let's try some exercises they're like great so the first thing i'll do is put two clubs in their hands the ends of the steel club facing down to the floor and starting to go into this hinge squatting movement where the clubs are just going back and forth with arms extended I'm taking them through the leg drivers and very quickly within a minute, they realize, oh, no, this can hit my legs. Yeah, it's completely different. It's not like a squat. You don't get, it's not the same feeling as squatting heavy. It's not the same feeling as just doing lunges. It's, it's a different feeling. I can't really explain it, what's going on, but it well, hurts. <laughs> yeah. And well, the thing is, is that it's calling on the activation that you need, but changing the angle of which that's, uh, calling on the demand because it swings forward. So now it's changing what you need to activate in order to keep it from pulling you off balance. And then it goes back and then it changes how that feeds through your body and what you need to activate in order to keep it from pulling you off your feet. And so by going back and forth, because you can do this with a tool that is designed the way the club is, it's narrow, you can keep it close to your body and now you can start loading that movement and that's, I mean, essentially that's an, uh, an essence of fitness is it's not just, do I have an amazing body? You know, that's one expression. The answer's yes. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. I don't love myself, hey. who's going to love me? Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. But so then if you've got, you know, if you're, there's, that's an expression of fitness, then there's strength. That's an expression of fitness. Then there's power. That's an expression. Endurance. That's an expression. And what we tend to miss out on is, well, whatever I'm good at, what, what are the elements that I'm not so great at? And what, that, what might that be highlighting in terms of where I might be missing or not as fit? And so just being able to challenge ourselves from different angles and being able to continually sophisticate what we do. I think one thing that a lot of uh, people who are familiar with steel clubs have seen are more and more are flows. This idea of, oh, I can flow with a steel club. And you can. I think actually the steel club as a tool is one of the most ex 
the most accessible to increasing sophistication uh, towards flow that you can get. And I also like flows because they teach you patience. Man. Because if you're, you know, one of those type of people that loves like workouts that just go crazy back to back forth. You don't like to wait between sets. You hate the idea of, of a break between sets. The flow will really test your patience. Can you stay calm and aggressive at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one of those things that, well, I can do a bunch of work. Awesome. What's another way that we can continue to challenge that work capacity is, can I do a bunch of work? in higher sophisticated movement. If I can do higher sophisticated movement and do it well and safely, it means that it is a reflection of having the pieces in place. And the clubs really challenge those pieces in a whole different way. So somebody getting into steel clubs, as you mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast, you don't need to start off with big weights. More than likely, you can't. Um, So if somebody's just getting started, maybe... You know, most of our listeners are in their 20s and 30s. You know, what would what would be a good weight to start with? And do you need one? Do you need two right off the back? Uh, what's what's a good way to get started? Good way to get started. So here's a little bit of a... Uh, this is a, an interesting dilemma with the steel clubs. Very interesting. Is the, the very first time anybody sees it. When they come into a room, it stands out. And immediately they think baseball bat. That's the immediate association. But there's something about the club that when you see it, you're like, ah, this is denser. There's something about this. And so you go over and it it kind of has this primal call. And everyone, and I've seen this. I've been doing this for at least a decade now. And I see it all the time. Everyone's like, ooh, what's that? And they go to pick it up. Because of the displaced weight on the end, the weight that you would associate with it is not what it actually is. So it will always feel heavier than the weight that it is. So 10 pounds, you may pick it up and go, this is 25 pounds. Like that's not 10 pounds. And so what happens is people pick it up and because of the displaced weight, it feels super unwieldy. It's Mm -hmm. going all over the place. You don't feel comfortable. And it's really kind of firing up and watch your teeth yeah definitely watch your teeth and that's all that's a part of the instinct to put it back down is on my face my brain like your nervous system is going if you can't control this thing i don't know if i can trust you with yourself and so uh it it calls to people they pick it up and then the minute they pick it up that they put it down because they're like ah this isn't they they don't feel like they really know what they're doing with it there's no sense of yeah that control because it it sets your nervous system off and it's really it's more of a nervous system thing and so getting into it can feel difficult initially but it's actually very accessible and the easy way to do that is to start light um you can have a single club if you're going to do there are basically three configurations that you generally work with steel clubs you have single which is holding one club in one hand there is double which is holding a club in each hand. And then there's two-handed, where you hold a club with two hands, a single club with two hands. And when you're working with those, if you go with a single, usually start five to 10 pounds. Uh, If you're going in with doubles, usually five to 10. Doubles is probably is one of the more challenging because you've got two things going on, these two weights sending two different signals down two different hands and and your brain kind of goes haywire. So it takes a little bit to get used to that one. If you go two-handed on a single club, that one you can tend to go heavier. So that one usually anywhere between like 15 to 25. But once you start getting to 25, the weight exponentially increases. And when you go from 25 to 35, the jumps feel heavier and heavier. What's the largest one we sell here at Onnit? 45. 45, wow. Yeah, yeah. and that one... You using that one? Uh, yeah, I use that one. Of course you do. But, you know, you got you to gotta build up to it. <laughs> and the thing is that uh, those would be the weights that you would start with. And I always, always recommend and get people to first work through the basics. 
You're going to look at presses. You're going to look at one that we have, which is a pullover. So if you were holding that cup of coffee in that I'm holding my cup of coffee position, and then you were to think about I'm going to throw that cup of coffee over my shoulder, that's a pullover. Mm -hmm. But as you throw that cup of coffee over your shoulder, your elbow doesn't end in front of you. You want to think about that elbow continuing to move up until it's pointing straight up at the sky. Mm -hmm. And then you pull it back to the front. Yeah. Those are, those are great for like biceps and, and triceps up here. Yeah. Actually, They're it's awesome. funny. We'll do, we'll do pullover work. And at the end, you get a people pump are, out of you it. get a huge you pump, a out, of pump out, of out of it. Yeah. And what it also does is it really, because like we talked about earlier, that forward flexion, we tend to be in that it opens up the shoulders it opens up the chest and it challenges our ability to keep that um, what I would refer to as frontline integration where you're thinking about the front of your body and all the connective tissue through it being integrated if I just haphazardly put a club over my shoulder and try and drive my elbow up one of the first places that people will tend to compensate is their ribs will really flare out. What that's indicative of is uh, uh, compression happening mm -hmm. in your spine, on your back. So that starts to highlight, oh, so it's bringing my ribs up. I'm going to think about draw my ribs down as I keep driving my elbow up to the sky. And mo what most people don't realize is doing something like pullovers very therapeutic for the shoulders, very healthy for conditioning that hip to shoulder to elbow connection if I were to do a press. So okay. if I have that elbow driven up to the sky and my hands down at my back and I were just to straighten my arm out, well, now I'm in an overhead position, which is what people do for when they press, mm -hmm. which is what they do for... Um, snatches it's what they do there's a lot of barbell work overhead squats all of that there's all kinds of issues that come from not having essentially a shoulder and its connection to hip through to elbow connection that's just not working so a club unique movement like the pullover that's one of those things that it provides so yeah. presses pullovers the leg drivers and working from leg drivers into swings mm -hmm. and just starting to work those in combination would be where I would start. Cool. So to listeners, you can actually go to onit.com slash academy. We have a ton of content there regarding steel clubs. A lot of them you'll see Shane himself in some of the photos, I think. Uh, yeah, actually, we have uh, videos at, uh, at onit.com and the videos are or on YouTube at the, on the Onnit Academy channel. And we've got over 120 videos on there. The dude with the big can sideburns. One each day for like three months. Three months straight. Uh, yeah, the dude with the large sideburns and the slightly longish mm -hmm. hair. That's the dude that's now got a grayish, chalkish mohawk. Yeah, got that dad mohawk. <laughs> <laughs> it looks good. So we always like to leave our listeners with a tip for total human optimization. Can, so if you, if you could give our listeners something. You know, if you could give them one tip for total human optimization, what would you offer? Slow your roll. So in any training that you're doing, slow when you have the opportunity, unless you're training specifically for something like speed or power, slow down the movement just a little bit. And by slowing it down, you'll usually find when you go through an exercise that if you speed up, it's usually because you don't have control through that particular range. And not having control through that particular range is what tends to lead to injury. And it may not be in the specific area, but it might refer to somewhere else. So slow yourself down just a little bit. Own every single movement, every range that you have. And this also translates just into your own training, being able to take time to slow down so that you have the tank and the capacity to speed back up. And uh, yeah, just let yourself slow your roll. Thanks for listening. If you want to listen to past episodes and make sure you get the latest as they are released, take a moment to subscribe on iTunes. Also make sure to visit onit.com, that's O-N-N-I-T.com for the latest in supplementation, foods, and fitness. I'm Orlando Rios, and you've been listening to Total Human Optimization. 